Hello, Silas here, and back with my friend Steven. Say what's up to the peoples. Hello, everyone, and happy Memorial Day to my fellow Americans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happy Memorial, ma, happy ma, 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 ma. Memorial Day to y'all, too. Hope you're having some American food. Maybe some people went to, like, one if I land, two if I see. That's <laughs> one of the few American restaurants that we've talked about in this Dishing on Dish series. And this is the series that we are having this conversation for. This is going to be part two. We're talking about the restaurant print. And Stephen, tell us a bit about this restaurant. Sure. So Print is a farm-to-table restaurant located near where I live in Hell's Kitchen. It's at 48th and I want to say 11th Avenue. And it's so basically you picture Hell's Kitchen, you picture picture where Times Square is. If you were to start at about the top of Times Square and head westward, that's where it would be. The restaurant is located in the Inc. 48 Hotel. So for those who don't know, the building, the hotel, the restaurant, the rooftop bar, this all used to be a former print shop, hence the name, print, print and Inc. 48. Um, very nice place. It was one of these restaurants I had walked by a lot on my own, but never actually went inside. So I went with my girlfriend, Christine, once. I enjoyed it. So then after that, I went back a few times on my own. I think like Dolly Varden, it's another one of these hidden gems that doesn't get a lot of press, but I think deserves more credit than it gets. So I wanted to try a bunch of their dishes and do a presentation on it. Yeah, and uh, with this series, we mainly focus just specifically on talking about food. Stephen lives in New York City. He goes to different places, takes some pictures, gorges himself with all this horrific food that he has to eat. And then he comes and he sends me a document and we just kind of discuss the food, the restaurant and other things. In part one of the series of whichever part one of the video, this is part two of print, we don't need go into a little more just about the restaurant to talk to things on the outside. But this time, since it's the second part, we'll go much quicker into it. In that first part, we go more into like the place, talking about the location, the tables, the ambiance. We talk about the content, we go over the menu, talk about if it's fixed price combos and things like that. And when we're actually discussing the food, we just give our general thoughts. Like I like to cook a lot, I've been cooking since I was like, even before in my teens, since I was a little kid, it's been in the kitchen and cooking. Uh, Steven himself has had experience in the food service industry, both front of the house and behind the house. He's actually uh, gone to the Culinary Art Institute, but that's not too important. He's just someone he also still cooks. He's still a fan of the food. So he knows a lot more about the actual restaurant industry, food service industry, food industry in general, and just the food that the knowledge that he gives on it is, is pretty in-depth. And I've been having a lot of interest with this series. And then as we talk about things, we get ideas of things to do. Uh, sometimes we just go online, go on little tangents and things like that and search out some information and things like that. And wherever you're listening to this, there will be an actual menu somewhere below, somewhere, if you're watching this in the video version, just in the low bar, somewhere below there, there'll be a menu so you can jump around to the different dishes. You don't have to just listen to the entire thing all at once. You can kind of come back, go back forth, back and forth to different things. We don't need to try to keep them to an hour and a half, but we should be able to finish off part two of print today. And this is also sure. a subsection of our you are where you consume series, and that's another series you can check out where we talk about food, other things in general, not just specifically like the actual restaurants, but things like one, for example, was like chowder, where we're just like, okay, how did chowder come to be? Like, why is this like a recipe instead of like some other meat or some other things and that other ones we talked about the French laundry? We've had separate ones talking about just the effect of the pestilence of of Sino origin <laughs> and its effects in New York City restaurant industry. And that was something that really affected Stephen because that's when he was still in the food service industry. And that also kind of served the end of him for now. He might eventually in the future get back into it by we're talking about starting our just more videos, posting things about our food. And things. I guess it's still kind of food industry by making these kind of contents and things like we're still, he's still involved somehow. But yeah, so otherwise, I got anything else to say? Well, I was going to say the address is 48th and 11th, so it's the furthest street over before the West Side Highway. If you go one block over westward, it's the highway right along the river. Just for those who don't know, I mean, you can you know easily Google this. I just wanted to mention. Yeah. And um, I've also, I don't know if you've noticed, but Christine and I have also been doing reels about food where I'll record the food and explain that. I've been doing that a little bit, too, because 
I find it, I can record it in maybe 30 seconds a minute, and then you can get a quick explanation, and also it's interactive. For example, we went to uh, Casa Lua recently, and we recorded the cheese plate, we recorded the appetizers, we recorded the uh, mozzarella being made, things like that. So I think that stuff's more interesting because you really see the craft and how it's made. I mean, photos are nice too, but I think with the videos, there's more potential for the interaction and what goes into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've done Casa Lula before. There's also chefnitup.carbon33.com. I might actually end up getting that domain name. We're in discussion of that. I just opened an account for Steven to, to need to send him the video of how he can upload his content on there. So we'll figure out ways to actually do this. Maybe in some of those recordings, the videos, we might actually start including them. We've already included some videos in this series when he has recorded them, but now if he's doing more, maybe we'll just have a thing where... Uh, after I put the name of the food. No, I think, oh, we'll figure it out. We, we might tie that in or we might just have that as shorts where you can see them on his uh, Instagram. We'll have his Instagram up uh, where you can actually find the link to it. And then uh, you can check out some of his reels there and also chefnitop.carbon33.com. Uh, uh, there'll be a link on the screen. There'll be a link somewhere below. You can also find other food stuff there. I've posted some of the things that I've made in the past. I need to do better at actually posting more recent things, but we're in the discussion of this as as this has been going on for how long has the dish and dish been going on now? Several uh, years. I think I worked at Netta, so that was what, 2017, 26, was it 16? Yeah. No, but we started, we started the, the dish and dish might have started I don't know. The first dish on dish was Minetta, I think. Oh, yeah. Dishing on dish. Yeah. I mean, we did food videos further Yeah, back. we did food videos Before. before but like dish on dish, we might be two years into it. And Something it's, it like seems that. to be a pretty good series. So, And we, we, we don't plan on stopping anytime soon. I mean, Steven's not going to run out of places to eat. And then we also were thinking of going into going into um, rest, books of recipes, talking about specific meals. We'll, we'll parlay this into more where we're actually more involved in actually cooking ourselves too and getting other people involved in this as well. I think I think it's going to be interesting as, as this goes because we know friends and people who are in other locations as well. Maybe they can go to a restaurant and then we can have a thing where they come on and they tell us about some restaurants somewhere else. Or I've kept talking about this. I don't really go out to eat much. I don't really go out much. But there's also restaurants. <laughs> I'm living in Nairobi, Kenya, and there's also some places that might be interesting where now it's like I could go out and get some dishes or something. But yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, see, we'll see about that as as this uh, this develops. We, we could also link uh, Christine's reels because the thing is her profile itself is friends only, but the reels are public. So okay. there's definitely a bunch of stuff from me as well as her in there. Uh, she's a lot less controversial than I am, but she tends to be more private about personal stuff. But the reels, we're trying to get more views, so those are public. But I mean, it's mostly like scenery, food, things like that. So I mean. Whatever yeah. your view, whatever, however extremist you are, whatever you can deal with, <laughs> just no problem. <laughs> yeah, we'll see about that. Okay, so we, we'll we'll figure that out. Now with print, um, what what was the genre of restaurant? If you we didn't mention that, like what type? What is it? Like a cuisine? What was it again? I mean, new American, but I, as I've said several times, that's been thrown around so much. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's. It, I guess you could say it's a farm-to-table restaurant. So they're very big on getting locally sourced ingredients. They have a connection with the purveyors. The menu is centered around what's available. So for a lot of these farm-to-table places, they'll go to Union Square Market or something, buy stuff, and make a menu with it. With this, they order directly from the purveyors. But I guess it's people that they know, they've made connections with. Mm -hmm. As mentioned last time, they have a forager in house who goes out and does all this networking and makes sure the product are up to par and all that so they said themselves they have eliminated the middleman because the idea is if you talk to them directly you know the people you can see what they're growing you can make sure it's up to par you can drop them if they disappoint you etc and they also grow some uh herbs on the there's a rooftop garden as well so it's you know it's a very nice idea of working with local purveyors supporting small farmers but also eliminating the middleman so you don't have to jack prices way up it's almost like a throwback. We, I think we also had, we might have had one. I and mean, this came up sometime in the past where we were kind of like, I have a pet peeve with certain sayings, annoying sayings. I've an entire series about annoying sayings where like people say things are homemade. There's like, you didn't make this in a home. First of all, like even if you made it in the kitchen at the location, it's not in a home. Like either, you, maybe if the chef made it at their home, then brought it in, that would be like, okay, that's homemade. I'm like, no, that's a kitchen. And then in some cases, it's not actually even made there. There's different versions to do that. But um, house made, I think, is something that is different. We say it's like or the house wine. So that's the wine of this house. But then we also talked to us in general how part of the reason this used to be that way is because restaurants in the past were literally just people's homes. Like the people who were cooking would actually just live there. 
they would normally live like maybe upstairs or even just in rooms in the back and people would come by guests would people travelers would be going around or you'd have a kind of inn situation where it's an inn you have some bedrooms and things like that and then the people the purveyors of the place who run the inn the, the it used to be like a family type of deal where the mom would be in charge of like the restaurant the cooking maybe some of the beddings if the, the father would be in charge of keeping the horses in the barn outside of the travelers coming in the kids would be involved in the type of thing and this kind of home home food cooking was a that kind of this is almost a current time on current year type of thing of it because it's at a hotel so it's kind of that in sort of thing where the people who are living in the hotel come and eat there with the, the special deals of course and they're, they're funneled through the restaurant yeah. then you see they're, they're planting stuff on the roof because they have the space there and i think this could be one of the future ways to see more places like this rather than just like an independent restaurant made just for a restaurant to have this kind of tied in situation by having the in there, you already have a set level of expected customers. Then you have the space where you can do things like um, have the garden and things like that. When you have those set customers and things like that, you have that basic stability, a lot more stability than I, than I would say just like a standalone restaurant with just those thin margins and things like that, where you can now start working into these kind of relationships where you have those people, that forager who's going out there and you can say, we're going to be here for a certain time. We know we're going to need this much food for these level of people at this amount of time. So I think it just, it just seems to be a different way of running restaurants than most of the restaurants that we've discussed in the series. And I think it's a it seems to be a positive way of kind of doing it. Yeah, you could, you could actually argue that this is an example of both horizontal integration and vertical integration because you're working with different purveyors, so you're streamlining it instead of having to them sell it to a wholesaler, you pay wholesale prices, then you sell it again, instead it's just going to the purveyor. So it's integrated that way, but then it's also, you have a restaurant, a hotel, and a rooftop bar all in one setting. So it's like, if people staying in the hotel wanna go up to the rooftop bar, they can, they wanna have dinner, they can. If somebody who enjoys a restaurant knows someone who needs a place to stay, maybe they could recommend them to, to the hotel, like it all kind of works together. Yeah, I can see this kind of coming back I, we've, we've talked about this. Uh, there's going to be many societal changes coming after this uh, recent two years that we've had here. And I think it's going to be uh, not, not the great reset in the <laughs> globalist sense, but the great a, a reset of sorts where people are now rethinking the way they were doing things. Like, I think most of us were, were rather shocked, maybe not Stephen or as, as much because he's been in the food service industry, to as to how... As, as to how certain places, like I, one of the shocking things for me was just like all these people who just like had these tons and tons of potatoes are just like, we just have to burn them now because we're only allowed to take them to this one, to this very few uh, locations. And then those potatoes are only made, they can only go to schools. Since schools are closed, we can't repackage these potatoes and send them to restaurants because that's an entirely different deal, entirely different person. I didn't know like the beef, the meat industry in the United States of America is pretty much tied into like five major butcher shops where like if you're doing yeah. it for like mass market, like all the all the beef raised in America needs to come through these like five central type of places. It's like, what the heck is going on with these things? And then you tie in like all these global supply chains of fertilizer being brought from somewhere else. Like you have cattle, you have your abilities to create fertilizer locally, but yeah. due to like these dynamics and fiat currency you should ship it. Anyway, <laughs> you can you can check out other conversations that we have where we talk about like general world issues and things like that. I was a bit surprised about that with the United States of America because I'm used to seeing things here in Nairobi, Kenya where you'll have people in northern Kenya starving and you'll have people in western Kenya like with with vegetables and and uh, produce going rot, rotting in the ground because yeah. the roads aren't there to get the food there to northern Kenya and you don't have enough people able to actually dig and work and to plant so you have logistical issues and things like that but you kind of expect that from a developing country but to see the messes up that was going on the cockups that were going on in the United States of America and that was that was a bit surprising for me and and I think things like this where you have more people going back into into the restaurants, we had a conversation with our friend um, Mark, and he was just talking about his family farm. And he said, okay, yeah, some of this stuff is, of course, to feed his family. Then he's already got a few people that he's actually working with. And I think you will see more of that kind of going back to the land type of thing where people are leaving cities, starting to, starting to create different kinds of commerce in places where maybe somebody works remotely for some tech company, but they got like a 10 acres in some small town somewhere. And instead of getting their 
stuff shipped in in their different kind of food companies in cities. They have the, they, their own little garden with like their own free wing chicken and things like that. Where like it's a, that that's kind of a, a sort of thing where I can see where it's like maybe a co op of of like a bunch of instead of having a small town or instead of having like let's live in an apartment, the people who would be living in an apartment in a city would move to like a small town and instead of living in that like five acre, twenty story building. They live in like 2,000 acres broken up into different places. And then everybody in that area is kind of, these are the people who grow beef. These are the people who have cows. These people have pigs. These people have uh, aubergines. These people have, and then you kind of just work together. I don't know. I can I can see something like that uh, that working out a bit more. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, okay. <laughs> so that's been a little, a little more of the tangent of, um, uh, we don't normally go too much into the intros and these ones. So I think without further ado, let's jump right into the actual First dish, and um, you ready? Yep. Okay, so we had left off at the uh, Duroc pork collar was the last one that we did. That that was also one that gave me some idea. I ended up doing something different with the bananas on that. It wasn't exactly this, because it's like a puree of it. But some of these things, we normally get ideas uh, when we're actually looking at the things. But uh, now the first one we're going to be talking about today is the... Heirloom sasso chicken, uh, roasted and smoked mole. Is it mole or mole? Mole. Mole and burnt leeks, paired with a Riesling from Mosel, Germany. Riesling. <laughs> Riesling. So, so sasso chicken, it's interesting. I didn't know this till after I tried it. I looked it up. It's actually an abbreviation. It's French. It's Selection Avicule de la South et du Sud-Ouest, which is basically... Um, avicole selection from the south and from the southwest. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously it's abbreviated because it's a lot easier for us to say. Um, it, it's a, it's a uh, French-based poultry company. It was founded back in the 1950s. So uh, basically it was founded, the idea was to preserve traditional chicken breeds. So that's mm -hmm. why it says heirloom chicken, because for those who may have heard heirloom tomatoes, heirloom vegetables, whatever, it's, it's maintaining... The original strain, because a lot of the things that we have today are hybrids. They've been, had different things added or things taken out to make them disease resistant, make the yield better, make them sweeter, all this. But this is preserving the original species in its original form. So th it may have a more distinct flavor or other characteristics, but at the same time, there's usually more work involved in maintaining these. Like, again, they may be the, the animals may be weaker. They may be more susceptible to certain diseases. They may need certain diets. So there's that concern. Um, mole is a Mexican sauce, uh, comes in lots of different colors. It just means sauce. It actually comes from the Nahuatl, that's the Aztec language. Um, there's a few different varieties. There's black mole, red mole, green mole, etc. cetera. Uh, typically there's chocolate in it. Uh, usually it contains fruit, nuts, uh, peppers, spices. Like there's usually black pepper, cinnamon, cumin, things like that. And then um, burnt leeks, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And then the Riesling is uh, one of my favorite types of wine. It comes from the Rhine River in Germany originally. This one came from Mosul, which is another river that goes into Luxembourg in France. Uh, Riesling I like because it's very versatile. You can have – I think I might have told this story before, but – at Eddie and the Wolf, the Austrian place I worked, we had a Riesling tasting, and it's cool because you have Rieslings that are bone dry, and you have Rieslings that are like ridiculously syrupy sweet, and then everything in between. This was somewhere in the middle. Um, you know, you get a little bit of fruit, but it's not too much, so I thought it went very well with this dish. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing this chicken. It looks like the chickens we have here um, – in Kenya, like they call it this Kenyaji chicken, which is just like the free range chickens, you know, and so they just literally just let roam, whatever. Like, if somebody has a like Kenyaji chickens, they'll have them at a farm, but the farm won't be like completely chicken cooped up, where it's like the chickens will literally just like leave the farm and go like explore whatever area they're in. Like, even sometimes when you're living in residential areas, you'll just be walking around there for like a few chickens just like on the side of the road, just like pecking mm -hmm. on things, and then at night they just go back home. It's like a typical thing, but in that situation, they sometimes they eat garbage, they eat like cars, so they'll eat a wide range of things in that sense. But if you have them out in like the in more of a rural area, and they just they just go kilometers away and then come back in at night. It's true free range, and I'll, I'll double check to see if the ones here we have because these don't look very similar. But then they could be just certain small differences between um, uh, why they're they're this way and not, and. Um, it's also interesting with this one, when you have the Kenyaji chicken, you normally get the full bird. But they have the broilers here as well, which are more like the, the farm-raised one, the Captain Coops and things like this. 
but we also do this whole thing where you use the entire bird and it's it's more it's leaner it's uh it's, it's more stringy of meat but it's it's really tasty um like my mom keeps telling us the story about when they were kids in, in the village and things like that it's like a bunch of like the kids they'd have when they'd have dinner like it, they would get the leg and then you'd tie like the intestines around the leg and they'd just like one off like eat the yes. intestines off of the, the actual chicken leg with the claws here and there's meat there and it's also like collagen you can get you can get a pretty decent soup if you just get uh if you if you have a butcher shop by you you can get chicken, the actual legs and things like that, and then you can make a decent soup with the collagen. Collagen is relatively healthy for people. I think it helps like the skin and things like that. Yeah. Something that you lose when you get older. So that's just something. There's, there's a lot of things to have. So it's kind of uh, interesting to see here. And I guess because it's also the older French type of thing, it might be something that has that has lasted for some time. And yeah, of course, the roasted leeks. Finally tried out different leeks things. We had some leeks here. So I tried out some roasted one. Roasted them for too long. Next time I do it, I'll do it better. Then I also did a, I'm uh, um, forgetting, what's the thing where you know we have like um, potatoes and, it's not a Lorraine, is it a Lorraine? I don't know, no, it, it was something, how, I, I'll, I'll, I'll well, try how to you, think. How do, you, how do you prepare them? That's what I would have to. No, in, so in this one, I, 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 I cut up leeks, sauteed it for some time, and then um, I used boiled eggs, and then you put like, uh, you put some... There's not a hollandaise type of sauce, but no, it's then you bake it together. I'm forgetting the name of it. I'll, I'll, not a, it's not a gratin kind of. A gratin, yeah. yes. I did yeah. a gratin, but instead of potatoes, I used boiled eggs and leeks, and it was it was maize balls. It was the first time making a gratin, and, and normally you use but potatoes is normally the, the base of it. But yeah, it was it was really great. I'll, I'll probably, probably put a picture on the screen. Not yeah, gratin, gratin means roughly with a crust, so it's like people think of potatoes, yeah. but I mean you, you can do it with all sorts of things as long as you can hold that like breadcrumb crust on top. Yeah, because that's the thing. Like you put the sauce on there, you put the cheese on top, and that's where the crust comes in. But then it's just, like using the the egg was it was a good way to do it because I was also thinking like with that, and then there's also the protein from the eggs instead of. And I started to think with the salad, and I did I make buns with it. I don't know. I forget what I had it, but yeah, it was it was it was really good. I really enjoyed that dish. So well, to, to add to your point about collagen, um, it also adds viscosity to stocks and broths. Um, like what it is, yeah. the collagen breaks down and becomes gelatin. So it's common when you make stock, especially in French type kitchens, they'll actually throw the chicken feet in or they'll throw duck heads or things like that. Or uh, for beef, they'll actually do a calf's foot because there's a lot in the mm -hmm. foot. So when it breaks down, there will be a bit more viscosity in the stock or broth. So you get a little bit of a body when you eat it in your mouth. And collagen is very good for you. I mean, good for skin, good for hair, good for connective tissues, all that. In fact, some people have been saying that a problem in American diets recently is a lot of that stuff's been stripped out, whereas a lot of that stuff used to be innate because – your grandmother made stock or whatever. She threw all yeah. the duck bones or whatever. So you just got that stuff naturally. But if it's been stripped out, you lose some of that. Yeah. That's that's another thing with this. The, 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 that's a weird thing about like That's another weird thing about developed countries. Um, the food just tastes blander. Like the average food. Yeah. Yes, you can go to a decent restaurant. Like when you go to print like this, part of why Stephen is saying this is a hidden gem and talking about these things, because they, they have that forager that's getting stuff direct from the farm, that's getting certain food. It might, this is not going to be the same chicken. Like, you can't just go to, like, right, you're right in the local supermarket and grab something off of, like, the meat section and plop it on the, ta on the, in the, in the table and have it be the same thing. It's, it's There's something different in there. That's why you have to, like, fortify all these foods. People are taking all these kind of supplements. Then when you have certain conditions come by, like this pestilence, like, there's lots of people who are alive, based off of like <laughs> they, their life is like supplemented by uh human means so like when something like this comes like it's strange like there's people who in a closer state of nature not the nicest thing would have died wouldn't, wouldn't still be alive but, yeah. but then but then you manage to exist and it's it's not just the, the food wise it's also things where it goes with um we can go with also like things like um, what you call it with like glasses. Like if if you if you, there's people who are just blind, you take their glasses off and they can't see crap. But if that person is living in a village in the, in the Amazon, they're not going to live long enough or be strong enough to be produced. But in America, they get glasses, they go to college, they study well, they become like a seven figure type person, they pass on those genes. So there's these kind of differences in there. Like they just happen in life. So now you have a certain thing where it used to be the foods that we ate needed to give us enough energy and strength just from the direct food that you're having in order to maintain your life. But then 
with the different kind of things where there's all this industrial waste and industrial processes, there's been people entering the food service, the food industry, where they're like investing. We're like, oh, we have all these chemicals. We have all these methods. We have all this stuff. We can repackage and resell it, refortify these things. Like, why do you need to fortify rice? Just serve them with actual rice. But no, it's because in the process of getting the rice, they strip it down and they need to put the things that are already in rice back in. And that's some of the stuff that's been left over from other processes. It's it's a mess. It's it's a mess. And I, I just that's one of my major complaints about like being when I'm in first world places, not first world places, because Europe is a bit different than this, specifically the United States of America versus like being in Europe when I was in Italy or being here in Nairobi. Food-wise, on average, it's do better. You can do you can do much better. Well, it it also my dad taught me about this when I was a kid. Like he always brought bought like whole wheat or whole grain bread. And the thing what I was reading is that with a lot of these produced breads like Wonder Bread or whatever, they strip out the parts of the wheat and the whole wheat. It contains the bran, the germ, and the endosperm, which has fiber, nutrients, and everything. And he was making the point to me like they strip them out of it, they sell it to the vitamin companies, they put it in vitamins, and then people buy white bread and take the vitamins. Like it just doesn't really yeah. make sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's. It's, it's it's unfortunate. This and, and and I think some of y'all can can look into things. Some people say, oh, this food is too expensive. Like, nah, it's kind of expensive not to take this food because you're going yeah. to be spending it on supplements. You're going to be spending it on bills by getting ill. Like, maybe if you just save up a little more. And actually, like, it's not even a lie. Like, the food itself is just takes more. Like, French fries. I have no problem with French fries. French fries are maize balls. But if you get like a potato and you just think about a baked potato, one baked potato eating it as the baked potato itself to store it in an oven and you bake it for an hour and you eat it that way versus eating it as French fries. And that's pretty much just cutting up that same potato and then you blast it in oil. It's still going to be tasty and things like that, but that one baked potato is going to be a lot more filling than the, fr the fried potatoes. And that's a simple process of just some of the content of the food, the, the, the life giving aspects of that food, the proteins, fats, <laughs> the carbohydrates, those things in the processes of preparing that food is taken out by that frying process. I think for you to actually get the same amount of nutrients from that you get from one baked potato, you might need to have two two potatoes worth of fried or French fries. So that's, that's just the things to think about when you, I think that's when, when people talk about the whole food, it kind of goes to that whole wheat. As close as you can get to eating the thing as it is to begin with, the more you're getting out of that actual thing. I think that's that's a good thing to remember. And I, I think this knowledge is becoming more and more um, more and more pre present in just people becoming more aware of the foods that they eat. What I think they were more aware in the past, that's one of the knowledge that I think people were more aware in the past than that dropped off and now it's it's coming back up again. Yeah. All right. So we can move on to the next one. Or you got anything else to say about the rising? Um, the, 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 the mole was good. It was, um, I, I, my taste... By the way the spices taste, I think there was probably cinnamon, a um, little bit of chili, so it was a little spicy, uh, some chocolate, hence the brown color. Really nice. Um, I'm not super well-versed on moles. Um, this one was good, but it's it just interesting. Like, I, I sort of compare it to, I guess, like, it's not it's not exactly the same, but I mean, like, how like I've talked about with India, how they have all these, like, curries and they have all these family recipes mm -hmm. and, like, everyone deviates. It's a similar thing with mole. Like, I think the basic formula is roughly the same, but everyone tweaks it a little bit with spices, depending on what they like. This one was very good, I thought. And uh, did you have any questions about the wine or? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, I, I wouldn't have too many, but, um, like, why do you think it went well with this dish? Well, I think Riesling, like I say, it's very versatile. Like it's it's not too dry, not too sweet. And this with this dish, this dish is somewhat mild. I mean, there's a little bit of spice uh, from the mole, but it's not too much. And um, a lot of those spices go well with the Riesling because it's slightly fruity. So it's like the fruit and the spice kind of work well together. But um, neither one is too strong and they complement each other well. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. And also like using chocolate outside of like desserts or just eating as chocolate, something I haven't really put into my cooking game yet, but might might look into into doing that. Like occasionally you will see it pop itself into different kind of things. It's also like things like pastries. If it's not like pastry, flour based or things like that, it's, it's something you could definitely add in, in other parts. Well, my understanding is that originally it was served with chilies and things like, I think it was, I forget if it was the Incas or Aztecs, one of the tribes they used to serve it oh, with chilies. Cool. And it, was, it was more bitter, but then over time they figure out, oh, add sugar and milk and other things and you get what we have today. 
Uh, yeah, technically that, it is a bean, so <laughs> it just makes sense. It's, it's more like a vegetable. Like it, it, it's a vegetable rather than a berry, so it makes sense that they're actually using it for, for things like that. Yeah, okay. Yep. All right, uh, moving on to the next yeah. dish we have here. And uh, who is this little guy here that we have? That's a monkfish with sauce American, American, and uh, chanterelles, trout, and trout roe. Sure, this was this was a really nice dish. So for those who don't know, monkfish, it's this really ugly looking fish. It kind of looks like an yeah. angler fish. Really, uh, you know, it tends to be a bottom feeder. Uh, very interesting to break down. I remember in school we did it. It has like a cartilage spine. It's often called poor man's lobster. I don't think it tastes like it. I think the texture is somewhat <laughs> similar. Well, this, this, the texture is somewhat similar. That's where the comparison is. And sauce American is actually typically served with lobster. That's why they did it with this dish, because, again, that whole theme. Uh, sauce American, it's typically um, chopped onions, tomatoes, white wine, brandy, salt, cayenne pepper, uh, butter, and fish stock. Uh, again, typically served with lobster, but this is sort of a play on that. Trout row, it's the eggs of a trout. I'm, I'm not sure which species, probably steelhead or something. The chanterelles were black, which is interesting. I hadn't, I didn't, I hadn't tried black chanterelles. Usually they're yellow. These were yeah. nice, though. And then uh, a little bit of tarragon. Tarragon's one of my favorite herbs, so I thought that was a nice touch. Um, I've actually seen lobster dishes served with tarragon, so again, I think it's kind of a homage to that. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because like the chanterelles really have that. Um, that's one of their key things. It's one of their key things that is that bright color. So they decide to go with um, with um, the black ones. It's it's interesting. Yeah, again, I don't, I don't know if it's, I guess I, I maybe it's the equivalent of, like, tomatoes coming in different colors or something. I'm not sure. Uh. <laughs> yeah. And the taste will be the same. This is not one where it changes that much with the taste. Hey, okay, do you think bell peppers have different taste by their color? I, I think they do. I think, I feel like the green one has a slightly more... I don't know, I don't want to say green flavor, but like... <laughs> no, but that's have, true. Like, <laughs> that's, that's how yeah. they describe it. That's the greener flavor. <laughs> if, you, if you have a yellow or red, it's like slightly sweeter or something. Like, yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I would say yeah, that there is there's a slight difference with the, the yellow and the red. But I, I don't think I would be able to really tell the difference between a yellow and a red. I don't know. Maybe I would. It should, um, I'll, I'll try that. I'll try to do like a blind taste test next time we get all three of them together. And see if I can actually tell the difference. But yeah, let us know in the comment section or somewhere if, if y'all think they have different tastes. And what are other the things that have different colors? Well, the other thing that just occurred to me too is I wonder if the sugar content differ between them, and that would affect cooking because you figure caramelization. If like if you were to brown one versus another, the flavor would be different. So that'd mm -hmm. be an interesting experiment too. Like try them yeah. side by side raw, try them side by side cooked, and see how it varies. Uh. Yeah. And what, okay, so what other things have different colors? Uh, okay, the cauliflower, no, it's the same. Uh, they have this purple ones. We've talked about that in the previous one. The flavor is uh, the same. Well, yeah. corn, corn, different corn varieties. Because like some. Yeah, of you the... see, like with that one. Unfortunately, when most of the corn, when you cook it, when you boil it, normally turns to the same. No, no, actually, when you boil the color, no, it has different taste, the different color. Yeah. Because there's what's called the Indian corn. It's like you see, like the blue, the red, all that. Um, but I've heard that those don't, I've heard that those don't actually taste that different. And the thing is, a lot of the corn we yeah. well, a lot of the corn we have in the U.S. it's engineered to be sweeter. Like people forget that typically corn was more savory. It's just we've engineered it to become sweeter than it is. Um, so if you have a lot of that, like old school, the heirloom varieties of corn, it that actually tastes uh, mm -hmm. more starchy or more uh, more savory. I should say, yeah. Yeah. Like here, we normally have the maize. Like you've got like sweet corn seems to be making rounds, but then like you know, it's normally just a typical hard, hearty ass maize. That's uh, yeah, but taste I don't know, it tastes that much different. But yeah, um, yeah, let us know on also other things that y'all think have different colors and different tastes, or the ones that have the same taste. Like with tomatoes, now with tomatoes, it's different because tomatoes, it's actually a different kinds of strains of tomatoes that have different tastes. Like. We recently been getting these little chocolate, small kind of cherry tomatoes, but they're more like oblong, more shaped like a football, like a rugby ball, but they're like really dark and black. And they really do have a, a it seems they call it chocolate. I think they call it like chocolate something. But yeah, they different, have an entirely different taste, really good for salads and stuff like that. I haven't tried cooking like heat food wise with them, but just using for salads is, is really good. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah, the t super ugly fish. Um, how Oops. meaty is this fish? I normally, does this guy watch Mas Masaru and uh, Kimgare cook? They're these Japanese 
the Masaru is a Japanese fisherman. He has a channel where he just he fishes some of the stuff that he cooks. Like he's like, this is poisonous, but I'm going to eat it. <laughs> it's like he's really, he's <laughs> really funny guy. But um, some of the things he like he has caught like stone fish and things like that. Where he, sometimes he'll get a fish like last one was like this armored fish where you can only get like the fish might weigh like ten pounds, but you can only get maybe like a pound worth of actually eating food wise from the actual thing and this monkfish just the body and the weird massive mouth and things like how much can you actually get meat wise well, from this actual fish when we did our fish fabrication class i saw this uh, girl break it down it was interesting because like there's there's three broad ways to fillet a fish there's the straight cut which is basically um which is basically how you do uh, salmon or trout because they have soft bones, so you slice through and then just pull out the pin bones. There's the flat cut, which is how you fillet flat fish. There's a certain technique with that because, you know, it's a flatter fish, so you have to run the knife along a certain way. And then there's up and over. I think that's kind of self-explanatory. Ones with really uh, hard spines and bones, you have to cut around, but you have to be careful not to leave any meat on the bones, but not cut off any bones into the fish either. And then monkfish is kind of weird because it's like this round cartilage spine, but there's like fillets of meat along it. And of course, uh, the head is really big, but you throw out the head because it's just like weird. I mean, I don't know, maybe you could eat it, but, but uh, yeah, nice, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if I would say how big it is, but I mean, it's like, it, it's a kind of a disproportionate fish where it's like this big head and then you cut that off and then the fillets like run along the side. Yeah, I don't know. Cause like there was, there's a fish, I'm trying to remember if it's hake or what it is. One of the fish has a really big head and it's often sold without the head on because if it's sold by weight and you include the head, it weighs more. <laughs> and if you throw, but then if you throw the head away, it's like, what's the point, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm, I found a video, this video here, like breaking down a monkfish. Maybe we'll put that in the, in the, in the links. And there's also, um, but this one, this, the video seems to be with the head or taken off. And now there's some technique breaking down uh, monkfish where some guys holding, like he has it like hung up on something, on some hook, and he seems to be like stripping it down and things like that. But yeah, so I guess different ways to do it. And yeah, it's it's a weird fish. But this is, yeah. <laughs> if you really want to see weird stuff, go into the ocean. Like it's just, and figure it out. Like the ocean is 75% of the planet. Like maybe, maybe we're the weird ones because like maybe most most of the, the earth is covered by water so most things are supposed to be like water like i don't know <laughs> it's, it's a mm. weird situation but yeah um yeah so that's that's the monkfish it's the ugly ass fish but it tastes good you said it tastes like uh like lobster like lobster so well i mean if i had it next to lobster i could tell them apart i think it's more of the texture like okay. i mean because some because some people like will say oh it's like lobster i don't really believe that if i had it side by side i could tell but i think the texture is similar enough and that's kind of what they were going for with this like take a sauce that's classically paired with lobster but do it with monkfish instead like it's a play on that yeah all right. Yeah, so now we'll jump on to the next dish. This is the last of the actual entrees before we get into the desserts. And here we have a local harvest steak with white asparagus, black garlic A1, and uh, Parmesan Sabayon, and paired with a Chianti Classico from 2016. So this was hands down my favorite entree. That's why I put it last. Um, white asparagus, again, self-explanatory. Black garlic A1. Um, I'd have to, it's black garlic, it's similar to black garlic puree. I know A1 has Worcestershire, garlic, onion, and other things, so my guess is that's probably what they do with this. Uh, Zabayon, for those who don't know, it's an egg custard. You whip up the egg yolks and you usually put wine in it. Um, the Italian one is called Zabiglione. Uh, typically they do Marsala wine and served as dessert. French, they usually do like a sweeter wine and serve it as a dessert. But this was a savory version. They put cheddar in, so of course, you know, it tastes like cheese, but it has the frothy egg texture. Um, Let's see here. And then the Chianti Classico. Uh, Chianti, it's a region in uh, it's it's a region in northern Italy. Uh, it stretches between Florence and Siena, 14 different municipalities. I when I think of this wine, I always think of Silence of the Lambs and him yeah. talking about having the fava beans. Yeah. So it was, it was I, funny. I, 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 I eat remember his liver with the fava beans and a fine Chianti. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well, it's funny because people would always come in and ask for Chianti, but the thing is, Chianti it has to be made in this region, and for Chianti Classico, it has to be made within a within a specific part of that region, which was the original region. So they say this area goes all the way back to the Etruscan times. So you figure that's like before the Romans, and then it was um, in the 13th century. The borders were defined. Uh, uh, so sorry, it was recognized as a wine region since the 13th century, and then the borders were defined in 1716 by an edict by Grand Duke Cosimo III de Medici. The Medici family is very prominent. Um, 
So it it has, you know, of course, unique characteristics. It has to be made according to specific rules. It has to be 80% Sangiovese and 20% of other grapes will either be native grapes like Can Caneolo, Colorino, or Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot, something like that. Um, again, it has to be in that original region and made according to those rules. Otherwise, it's just Chianti in general. And then there's also another version, Chianti Classico Reserva, which it has to be made in those region by the rules, but I think it has to be aged so long or something. So this is what I was saying about how Italian wine is different from French because with French, they're very rigid and rules can't change. With Italian, people kept trying to break the rules, so they had to keep redefining <laughs> things. To, you know, so, oh, this is Chianti, then let's expand it. Oh, well, now this is Chianti Classico. Well, if it's made this long, it's Chianti Classico Reserva, <laughs> things like that. Yeah. So, that's, so, that's uh, one thing about Italy in general. It's it's yeah. um, it's it's almost like a mini United States where the regions are really like the Italian spoken in different regions is yeah. almost in this, like you almost can't understand each other. And they're, they're very, it was a place where there was principalities and things like that for really long, where it's like Venice was its own nation. Like uh, the, tu the tu Turin area was its own nation where these, like Rome, of course had before the Vatican thing, like that was like its own. Okay. But yes, there was Roman empire, but then post that, like these, these places were very, you'd have like a small town on some small hill somewhere that was its own culture, its own food, its own peoples, its own histories and things like that. It's almost like a second world country. I think it bridges the gap between like developing world and the developed world in some of the customs and just some of the, the ways the, the people are. It's so yeah, it's, it's still a good place. So that's good times. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I cut well, you off. Well it was well, it was funny too, because I remember what one of my teachers in school said, because he he's Italian American, but I guess he went to Italy and he like stayed with families, learned how to make pasta and all this. And he was talking about this and he said Northerners and Southerners don't like each other. He goes, Italians, not Americans, guys. War's over. <laughs> yeah. Like, like the, the weird thing, but like we, we talked about this earlier, how like some people like get offended when you like insult a certain place, certain location. Like you, yeah. the, the, I think the whole idea of like Italy in general isn't as strong in Italy as it is in other places. But if you go to like Sicily and you make fun of Sicily, they'll get mad at you. Make fun of the, of the uh, sorry, of the Napolitanos. They will they will make fun they will they will get mad that you defend Napoli. But if you're in Napoli and you make fun of Sicily, they're not gonna be like, oh, you're making fun of Italy. They're like, okay, <laughs> they probably join you with some of that stuff. Like that's that yeah. kind of thing where, where the, the regional type of um affinities and in it's it's also like that in some other parts of, of, of Europe and things like that. Most definitely in developing countries like here in Kenya, the, the concept of being Kenyan is still very new. People still very tied into their tribes and their locations, things like that. But of course, that's changing with uh, the gener my generation and younger, some of them who have been born in like cities, so amongst other people. But yeah, it's it's an interesting world out there. But yeah, from the Chianti Classico here. And okay, so with, with steaks, um, of course, it's like the different cuts. You could have local harvest steak. What was the cut? Do you know what cut it was? Uh, I'm trying to remember if it was... Was it strip loin? Oh, uh, the guy told me, but I don't remember because I think this is one of those you could probably tell by the shape it was trimmed down to be more mm -hmm. uniform. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it was. Strip so why loin. harvest steak? Why is it called harvest steak? Is it because it's like it is this local or? harvest? I guess it just means okay. like they know the purveyor. He's not that far, you know. The cows oh, yeah. they keep an eye on them. Yeah, and um, is. It I know this is something people could choose. Most people do medium rare. That's like the, the I think the most typical way people get steaks. But uh, is there any steak, sort of meat, red meat wise, that you think is supposed to be is better if it's like well done? Like, in my opinion, no. I mean, maybe there are people. <laughs> who just, usually, usually, what I find what it is is um. There's that whole thing about how a lot of people from poorer families are used to having stuff well done because the meat that they had wasn't as good. So in their okay. mind, it's it's OK, I have to cook the hell out of it. Because Some of my dad's family was like this, because remember, my grandparents grew up during the Depression. So to them, it's like they got what they could, meaning they probably didn't get the best stuff. So they hammered like all their red meat, which, again, makes sense. And I kept trying to explain to my grandmother and others that, like, if the stuff is properly handled, it's fine. But I guess, you know. It, when someone's so set in their ways they've been doing it it's like yeah. really hard to yeah you know. now it's funny because with my dad um he typically has steak uh well done occasionally he'll have sushi though um because i've told him i'm like if you eat in a reputable place the stuff is handled well i mean it's not perfect i mean there's a chance you'll get sick but i was like if you got sick off rare or raw stuff i would have dropped dead a long time ago because i've been yeah. eating like this for you know so it's like 
if you eat in like a CD place or like you buy meat, you let it sit out or something, yeah, it'll be bad. But it's like, you know, if a place does that, of course, there's going to be lawsuits and other things. So, uh. yeah, we've talked about this before. It's like some places they should just like the chef should just like come out and like serve it as as they want that fits the dish in in, in the way that that it should be. Yeah. Um, I was I had an experience where I was um, I was, I was making some food for some guests. And then uh, the, the timing was a bit off. Like it, it took a little longer to do one part or get the person there. So I had to keep the chicken breast. I did like a quick sear on the chicken breast and I put it in the oven, like covered with uh, some rosemary. Uh, what was it thyme or rosemary? I don't know, some twigs and some garlic. But um, the chicken got really, got rather well done. It was like almost like a well done chicken breast. But because it had infused like the butter and the flavors and things like that, it, it was still good in some way. Like it was very like when you actually eating the the fibers were kind of separating. So in in a way with the sear, it had still trapped enough of the of the um, of the juices inside. So it was more like the juices kind of steamed up and cooked the inside. So it was stringy, yet it was still soft. If that makes any sense, and that was like a different way of chicken chicken breast that, I, that I've had before. And I almost I'm glad you tried to repeat that again. So that was different with like doing like chicken breast, where like hey, we, we can even do like well done. I know people try to avoid like salmonella and things like that. So you're not you're not really suggested to have things like chicken like raw at all, like they're like chicken tartare. So like a regular thing you find out there. But um, yeah, so that was just a different way of doing it. That's white meat. But yeah, I, it, like as I said, I I don't know. Maybe if you're but that goes to like towards like jerky. That's like something else. Like even because even when you do like a pulled pork, it's not it's not well done. Yeah, it, I I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if well, you no, do like well some done, kind of well done, done thing. It it is well done, but it's braised because the idea is yeah. you cook it through and then it's cooked slowly and it just breaks down and then you pull it yeah. apart and that's how you eat it. But it's cooked so down. It's, whereas if you were to just throw it like in a grill or on a pan, it would just seize up and then if you were to eat it, you'd be chewing on strings. But if if it yeah. cooks down gently, it breaks down enough that you can pick up pieces and eat it pleasantly. Yeah. So there might be a way of doing like a well done thing where maybe you you spread it apart and you can use it as part. Like you can put it inside like a beefy salad or something just for some protein or something. Yeah, I don't know. But um, so yeah, otherwise Abraham and I will. Abraham and I want to check out this place near me. It's actually uh, an Israeli chef. It's interesting. It's not kosher, though, which I like because it's all the stuff I enjoy. Uh, he does this thing with steak where he actually slices a steak super thin, actually layers it with butter, presses it together yeah. to form a new steak, and then cooks it like that. So I'm curious to try something like that. Yeah. <laughs> interesting. It's like a handmade Kobe or sorts. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that, that could be interesting. Yeah. yeah, let me know once once y'all go. Maybe we'll do like sure. it's just like a, a a few dish one. We can do like a shorter one of that. Well, yeah. yeah. If 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 it goes well, I may go back on my own or take Christine, and then we'll you know like this. We'll have like three or four dishes. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. So now going to the next dish here, we have some uh, camel camel some camel creme brulee with uh, Wilkins Honeybee Farms snickerdoodles. Sure. So I picked this when I went with Christine. She loves chamomile tea, so I thought this dessert was chamomile. probably up her alley. It's uh, I thought it was really good because, I mean, it's sweet, but you still taste the floral element. I mean, creme brulee, for those who don't know, French means burnt cream. You basically cook cream. You put it into a uh, little container. It's called a brulee dish. Sugar on top. Hit it with a blow. Well, you cook it in the oven first, then you put the sugar, then hit it with a blowtorch so it's crunchy on top. And then the uh, Honey Bee Farm Snickerdoodles, I guess, local purveyor, they make their own cookies or um, Snickerdoodles are sugar cookies, usually big around Christmas time. Uh, it was a nice dessert. Yeah. yeah. They got a, they, it's, a, it's a honey farm. It's not, it's not a farm specifically for <laughs> growing yeah. Snickerdoodles, yeah, although yeah. nobody actually do. <laughs> I don't think people yeah. thought that. But yeah, there's a, there's, there will be a link to their, to their website on the, on the links below. So they have different things. Of course, honey is, the, is their primary thing, but it, it's just a different thing. Again, we talked about this before. If you have somewhere... If you if you have created something, it's also good to have like a value added. Like not, if you have you already have the farm, you already have the honey. So you, some of the honey that you have there, just make some other product that already that also um, advertises your actual product. Like oh, this is something you can do with our products. And also when you're packaging, when you're doing some of these, things, some of the honey will say, or so maybe they use some of the stuff like that. There's many reasons to do this. The, they seem to have like okay, they have online courses, in-person courses, so with other things that you can actually do on the honey farm. Uh, I don't know if they have like so on in-person courses. I don't know if that's probably you go to the farm and you see the bees and things like this. With bee farms, I don't know if it's 
just people who are doing honeybees in specific or if they use other bees for this. But there's also a thing with like farming where people will normally rent bees to uh, to uh, pollinize, not pollinize. Pollinate. To pollinate, yeah, to pollinate yeah. Uh, during the, the, the right part of the season, right? Like people, people go around with bees to massive farms and they're just like, okay, for a couple of days, we'll bring our bees here so they can, uh, or like a week or whatever, so they can pollinate all the all the different vegetables you have here and things like this. So that's that's part of also what happens. I don't know if the honeybee people just do honey themselves or there's people who it's like when they're not making honey or while they're making honey, we also have different bees that do that. So it's it's an interesting thing to, to go with this sort of thing. Well, if you notice, too, that honeys are sold, many of them, they'll actually advertise the flower that the honey predominantly comes from. So, for example, you'll see rose honey, orange blossom honey, clove honey, all that. So my sense is if it's more mixed, like these people who live next to us growing up, they used to actually have a beehive and they would produce their own yeah. honey and they'd give it to us. But they would say it was clove honey. My guess is that it's, it was probably a mix in reality, but because there's lots of clove growing in fields and stuff, that's probably what they're mostly getting it from. Whereas yeah. if it's rose honey, like maybe those purveyors have a lot of roses, so that's where the bees go, things like that. And um, if you'll notice honey side by side, you'll see different colors, usually yeah. lighter or darker. They say a darker uh, actually means more antioxidant, so it's good for you. And the flavor will vary a little bit if you do if you were to do a side-by-side -side comparison it's a, little bit. it's a lot i've yeah. had a wide range of honey taste yeah. right, go ahead yeah because because yeah again you can pick up like the rose versus orange blossom versus clove and you know you could do some interesting stuff with that like pairing it with different desserts or things for different effect yeah well that's the difference with daisies have you had like daisy tea like chamomile kind of looks like daisies <laughs> oh, daisy. i don't know because i've had i mean i've had rose obviously um Chamomile. Um, I wonder if you yeah, could do lilac. Hibiscus is one of the typical ones that you find out there, hibiscus flower, where they do that. Well, there was a tea I think I told you about in culinary school we had called Ruby Sipper, which was actually blood orange and hibiscus. And what was interesting was that the flavor came from the blood orange, but the color was the hibiscus. Because yeah. if you steep the peels in water, it doesn't do anything with color. But then hibiscus is just red. It doesn't have much flavor. So if you combine them, it has this like cool red tea that tastes like orange. So that was kind of nice. Yeah, because like with tea, uh, some of y'all might know, if you just go out and you cut, cut some typical grass and boil it in water, that, that's considered a tea. Tea is pretty much just boiling leaves or flowers in, in water. That's, I mean, yeah, boiling, because you have to get to the boiling process. And if you just steep it into it, I don't think it's the same thing. It wouldn't be considered well, tea in that sense. I would have to look more into it, but I remember learning a bit in school. There was this uh, Vietnamese girl in our class, and I guess she knew a bit about this, and she talked about it with the class. There's rules with different types of tea as far as temperature, like white tea you're supposed to do lower, mm -hmm. black tea is the heaviest, green is something in between. And there's a whole thing where if, if it's too hot, it gets bitter, but then too light, it won't release the flavor. So there's an ideal yeah. temperature for each type of tea, but it's like I don't know that off the top of my head. I'd have to look into it. <laughs> and that's it. Like even with green tea, you're not – I mean green tea, you're definitely not supposed to steep it in – in, uh, I mean, you can steep it, but you're not supposed to like, you don't put it on like a kettle or on a stove and like let it boil and get all the flavors going into the water. Yet with black tea, you can do that. You can leave it and get let the tea infuse, especially here when you're doing like a milk tea type of thing, like a chai. It, it's normally a thing where they'll actually do a process where they put the milk in the water, then you put the, you put the, um, the, the black tea leaves and you can put, of course, uh, tea masala or whatever flavors you want. But you get you get it up to the boil, you drop it down below the boil. Get it up to the boil, drop it down below the boil. Like, you know, like, you do at least twice of things like that. And you, the flavor really infuses into the actual tea. Whereas with green tea, it's like, okay, just boil the water. And then even if it's like, even if you're boiling water before, even right before it comes boiling, you can take it off and the green tea will still already be infused into it. And the green teas normally just... Um, it's only the leaves of of the tea plant that haven't yeah. been made, they've been dried, but they're not like prepped or roasted or whatever they process it to get like the black tea, which is more like granule. <laughs> it's like the whole plant's been broken down different things. Yeah. So that's a, that's a, the primary difference between the two things when you're talking about the tea plant, tea made from the tea plant. Yeah. Yeah, flavor and also the caffeine is different. Like black tea actually has more caffeine than coffee. And um, hmm. I think white, white tea is either caffeine free or very low and green is like something in the middle. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, so some of y'all might be thinking you're escaping that caffeine by getting off of uh, coffee and going to tea, but it's, it's coming after you. But there's no nicotine. Nicotine's in coffee? No, that's no, it's, I don't think it's tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I was going okay. to say, too, it's that thing I remember learning about coffee, how uh, 
coffee beans in their raw state actually have more caffeine and the more you roast it the more caffeine you kill so you're actually going to get more of a buzz eating straight coffee beans than if you were to have coffee like um i remember that like that's why starbucks and some other companies actually started making drinks with green coffee beans because it's more concentrated but they have to add mm -hmm. fruit and other things because it doesn't taste like much um but i remember like my teacher in school saying that like raw coffee beans are going to have a lot more caffeine than say espresso but people just think oh it's a small dark concentrated thing it must have a lot but in reality you're going to get more from green beans <laughs> yeah yeah this goes back to what we're talking about with the potatoes the, the whole of the food the more you're getting out of whatever is in that food very few foods gain more during a manufacturing process or during the processing of, of the actual food to get yep. into your plate yep. ah. So now moving on to the next dessert here, we have um, a strawberry rhubarb pavlova, uh, pink peppercorn meringue, and yuzu cream paired with a Churchill vintage port from 2017. We've, we've had pavlovas, what was the first time we had, it was like some, it was one of the first ones we had like two different pavlovas. I want to like say it was DV Bistro. It was DV Bistro. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to Kyra here as well, because this is uh, one of her favorite desserts. So when I post Pavlova, I usually tell her. Um, uh. So I thought this was a very creative dessert. Uh, pink peppercorns are actually in the meringue, which is interesting. I never seen that before. Uh, pink peppercorns were used before. I had mentioned that it's not actually a peppercorn, but it's the dried fruit of a uh, plant in Brazil. It looks like looks like peppercorns and I guess similar shape. So that's why um, strawberry rhubarb, of course, being springtime. So that's on the outside. My guess is they probably uh, simmer it lightly on a stove with a little sugar or something. And then yuzu cream. Yuzu uh, is the Japanese lemon. I always describe it as having a slight evergreen flavor to it. You can get it in the U.S. It's usually either dried, zested, or uh, juiced, though, because it's harder. You can get it fresh, too, but it's less common. And then Churchill Port. I had, I had some Churchill champagne shortly before this, so I thought I'd give this a shot, see how it was. It was decent. Um, it was one of the cheaper ports they had. I just felt like trying it. I mean, they had better ones the better ones are aged longer they're more developed but of course you you spend more money because the port as it ages in the barrel it, it reduces sort of like balsamic vinegar so the idea is that if you have a later date it, it's it's a lower yield because they make less of it so you pay more money yeah so that's that's what they mean by port i've never really understood that well it, it's from uh it's from portugal um it's originally i want to say i think it was the british uh that started it like the british started sherry as well but it's named after jerez um, let me see here. Yeah, it's a Portuguese fortified wine made in northern Portugal. Um, typically sweet, uh, although you can also get it dry and white as well. Um, yeah, it's great. It's it's they have to be demarcated in this area. It's um, they add a neutral grape spirit uh, to stop the fermentation, which leaves residual sugar. That's why it's sweet, but it also boosts the alcohol content. Um, People compare it to brandy, but it's not really. It's pretty different. Um, it's sold in barrels, um, stored in – you put in barrels, Asian cellars. Um, let's see here. Yeah, it's usually – No, it's like it's, – it's, so it's a process. So you can use a wide range of different grapes to create port wine. Port wine is more the process of, of making the wine rather than the grapes. Well, no, no, it's typically produced from grapes grown and processed in the Douro region in Portugal. I mean, I suppose it's sort of like the whole thing with sparkling wine versus champagne. Like, you could copy the method with grapes from other areas, but they would say it's not true champagne. Like, you could do that with port, too. Like, you could copy this method, but they would say it's not real port because it's not um, made in that area with those grapes. Okay, so the rear door. Okay, I found some of that. Okay, along the rear door. Yeah, they seem to be... Bunches that grow close together, really. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that that is port. Um, yeah, it's more like towards like it's like almost like a whiskey wine. It's like it's like a liquor wine. It's like between. It's it's like malt wine. No, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's different. There's something different about it. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought I it was. Uh... I thought, you know, I thought, like I say, with port, they, when you age it, it develops. It's like a lot of wines. If you age it a bit, it develops other flavors, so it's more complex. So this this one was, like, sweet with, like, a little bit of red fruit. But, like, if you age it more, you might get, like, dried fruit elements. You might get coffee elements. You might get caramel, things like that. Yeah, Yeah. now this rhubarb, what, how is it prepared? Like, it's just uh, like put inside, like, a simple syrup and... and yeah, my guess for, is probably... For a bit. Probably cooked on a stovetop. I mean, it was cool when I got it, but my guess is they probably cooked it enough on the stove to, like, you know, actually cook it all the way through and then spooned it out onto the plate when it's served. Um, it's cold when I ate it, but like I say, they cooked it down, so the strawberries are cooked, the rhubarb is soft, all that, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, and I know we mentioned this when we talk about desserts. The four C's that are normally in desserts, coffee, chocolate, caramel, and citrus. Those are normally yeah. the four C's that are advised to be somewhere in it. it doesn't, you don't have to do that, but you can do that in the creme brulee. Of course, like the brulee part, that's good to caramelize some stuff. Yeah. You're going to have some caramel in there. Uh, and this one, you don't have any of them. Well, yeah, I don't have any of them. Well, yeah, this citrus. Still... Citrus, yuzu. Yuzu is citrus. Okay, yuzu, yeah, yuzu is citrus, yeah. Uh, sometimes when we talk about these dishes, like the first time we mention something, I'll put it on the screen. Like if you're watching the video version, uh, but um, sometimes we've talked about using before. Sometimes if we've talked about it in the previous one, I might not bring it up every time we do it. But I try to try to do that some some something visual for the people who are watching the video version of this, and we'll be working towards. I've been saying this for some time, but eventually we'll get an actual like audio podcast version of this. But with some of these, I think it's good to actually see the dish. Yeah, when we do when we finally do the podcast run, maybe. Maybe I'll start adding actual images, this document with the images. Maybe we'll also include that on the blog when we post the blog post. So for the people who are watching the video version or listening to the podcast version, they can still see. Although there's also this podcasting 2.0 thing, this kind of new thing where you can use certain apps that have podcasting 2.0, where you can put like chapter images. So like the image would change when you get to like the different sections. It's just, just something that some people might be using. I've I've found out about that by like listening to the No Agenda podcast. But yeah, uh, getting back <laughs> to the dishes. Okay, so the next one here is um, chocolate souffle. And this is Casa Lucre chocolate with mint chip ice cream and a cappuccino to drink. Cappuccino. Sure, so Casa Lucre is a uh, Colombian company uh, known for chocolate. I don't know much about them. I guess they've been around, uh, I think since the early 20th century I was reading. So I guess they're quality brand um you know it's definitely good dessert so i guess they're known for quality i have to say this mint chip ice cream is actually the best i've had um they were telling me that they're actually using uh the fresh mint that's grown on the roof it has a very clean taste like if you were to like have mint directly like but like add some sugar to it or something like that's practically how this tasted it had a very clean flavor mm. whereas a lot of the mint ice creams they just throw in uh mint oil and like dye but this actually tasted like yeah this tastes like mint though like America this, what are you yeah. doing <laughs> Well, because I was, I was saying to the guy, like, I mean, I used to pick uh, spearmint, apple mint, peppermint in my backyard. And, like, this tasted almost like that, but with sugar. Like, it tasted very clean. Whereas the other stuff, it's like, like, if I have almonds versus almond extract, like, I can tell the difference. Because, like, the almond extract has alcohol and stuff. And it's like, you know, yeah. you can tell it's not the same. Yeah. Like, like my, this is one thing when my brother was visiting uh, Spain. Though, he was posting something about Fanta. And the Fanta in Europe is... It looks like fresh squeezed orange juice, not orange juice that you get from like uh, Minute Maid or something like that, where it's like, or it's like yellow, it looks like Sunny D or something. Like, no, like actual, just you get an orange and you squeeze it. And not even just like the Florida oranges, like super, just, <clears throat> sorry. The typical orange is actually not that orange. Like most oranges mm. are more like yellowish. So they actually use like the fresh, or like use actual orange juice in there, use real sugar. They don't put, so that's one of the differences about like Fanta and just all all sodas in Europe and is that I've had. Yes, you can find some of these other uh, more like sugary, more processed drinks, but it's another thing that I think most people in America are just missing out with with some of the things that they get. They get the simulacrum of the actual thing, where when they actually get a fresh, organic, closest to what the actual thing tastes like, like this doesn't taste like like these oranges don't taste like orange juice, because. The orange juice doesn't taste like oranges. <laughs> so that's some kind of kind of thing there. And then here in Kenya, like yes, they put the food coloring in the Fanta, but the Fanta it seems to have like more like vanilla kind of flavor. Now I don't know if that's the difference because of the recipe, but they also use actual sugar, cane sugar, for the actual sodas here in Kenya. So like the cokes, everything you'll find them. They'll be a slightly different recipe, different taste than the ones in the United States of America. And the United States of America, of course, most of the things you're going to have is a lot of like corn syrup type of things in there. And corn syrup just doesn't it just doesn't cut the mustard when it comes to actual sugar. And it's the thing I just and just think about it. What is the process to get oil or syrup out of corn? Well, remember remember we uh we talked a little bit about that. What was it in the I think it was Cracks in the Ivory Tower where they were talking about Archer Daniels Midland, that company is actually subsidized to produce corn syrup. 
because they lobby for tariffs on foreign sugar, so it's more expensive. And then in turn, they use the money to make corn syrup, which is, I guess, overall, it's cheaper than sugar and it's a lot stronger. That's why they use it. But it's like it's much worse for you. Like it's very high in the glycemic index. And that's another reason you see so much obesity, because if you have all this stuff sweetened with it, it's just going to blow you up. <laughs> yeah, your body just can't break it down. We, we, it may be in some of these things. Your bodies are going to adjust. We're going to evolve to be able to take in. It's not just sugars. We evolved to break down sugars in their form when they're actually in fruits and things like that. So it's going to be a lot harder for you to not that you can't become obese by just eating fruits, but you it's your body can break down and deal with those fruits and convert them to usable energy a lot easier. So if if it has some content in it and it's like okay, we can't do it, we'll just shunt it over here into the fat stores. And your body will be in an energy dip. So you'll be like, okay, we need more food and things like this. And this, is, this is food knowledge is out there. If you listen to this, you have access to a lot of food knowledge, a lot more food knowledge that you've had available for most of 99.9% .9 of humanity. But those people were just healthier physically in some sense. They were you know, they were more athletic just because of the, the basics of life. You just had to walk and move more and you had fewer actual uh, access to to calories where you can have this abundance of calories you couldn't just glut yourself with calories but i don't want to say they were technically healthier because you probably a lot more diseases although at the same point as i mentioned with steven earlier some of the diseases that people live with today due to medical advancements where they just sit constantly on medication and things like that uh their physical constitution has been able to live with diseases because they have the management of the medical systems in the past if you lived past a certain age you were selected by nature to be physically <laughs> more resistant to certain diseases and things like this. So you'd actually, you might be more resistant to certain things. You might have a more robust immune system. Your immune system was more tested in the past than it was now. But I don't know. It, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's a mixed bag. Sure. Okay, so anything else you have to say about this? The cappuccino, how was it? With the little uh, biscotti they have there? It was... Yeah, I just wanted to sort of post that because I thought the biscotti was well done. Like, I feel like a lot of the biscotti you get in stores, it's been sitting in the jar forever. It's like you bite into it, you feel like you're biting into a rock. This one was soft, <laughs> meaning it was probably pretty fresh. It was well made, dark chocolate, almonds. Um, my guess is they either make it in house or got it from their bakery. I thought that was a nice touch, though. Like, you can tell it's fresh. It's not something that's been sitting and thrown on as an afterthought. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Yeah. Here you go with the new one. The next one is a pistachio baklava yep. with a hand pulled phyllo, the ceiling pistachio, pistachio, um, honey, lemon curd ice cream. Yeah, it was funny. So the first time I went with uh, Christine, I remember she was like, she was trying to get me to get it. She's like, oh, honey, baklava, your favorite. Because when we go to a coffee shop, we, I always would get baklava. Um, but I thought, like, oh, I have it all the time. I'll try something else. But then I ended up trying it later because I wanted to see what they did. I thought it was really interesting, the shape of it. I mean, it's like, you know, the whole they punch it out with a ring mold. They cut the slits in it for presentation. Um, the dough, I guess they make in house. I've never made phyllo myself, but I guess that's what they do. Pistachios inside. Uh, honey, of course, is in the pastry itself. Um, there's some candied lemon zest underneath, and then that's lemon curd ice cream with some lime zest. For those who don't know, lemon curd, it's um, it's the it's egg yolks, uh, lemon juice, lemon zest, sugar. If you make lemon meringue pie, that's basically the basis you see on the bottom. Because if you think about it with lemon meringue pie, what it is is you're using the whole egg because the whites on top are whipped up uh, to make the meringue, which goes on top, and then the yolks are used in the curd, which is mixed with lemon and stuff, so it's it's the egg and the white separate. So I guess they did this with, um, they mixed the egg yolk and lemon into ice cream, so it has that flavor. It's really nice, I thought. Yeah, yeah baklava's normally, like, yeah, I, I, you know me think of rectangular, rectangular serving type of things so they normally go with. So yeah, it's interesting to see this in this different shape. So see the pistachio. Uh, yeah, it's definitely, ab definitely above average. Like I said, I get baklava at our local coffee place. It's just like a little square with pistachios. So I thought, oh, do something else because I have it all the time. But um, this I thought was very good, very creative. Uh, okay, and there's something specific about baklava that needs to be pistachio. Is that the typical one or the like, wide range of them? I, I've had it before. It's it's okay. I'm not against it. I'm not like, oh, we should get some baklava. But uh, yeah, it's... Is it pistachios? Is a typical Greek? It's a Greek dish, right? Um, is it um, Greek dish? It's Greek or Turkish. It's it's Greek or Turkish. Uh, the word itself I'm looking yeah, like, up is actually like people get fights for that. Yeah. <laughs> get that wrong. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You look it up. Well, uh, I, I, I think you could use other nuts. It doesn't have to be pistachios if if it was this. If that's but that might be the, the original. 
Yeah, my understanding is that they said it's just chopped nuts in general, um, but they're not exactly sure like where it came from. Um, so it's like my guess is probably pistachios because that part of the world, the climate. I mean, if it went into cooler climates, they probably use walnuts or something. Yeah, like I know a lot of Greco-Turkish food is popular in Eastern Europe. Like my uh, one of my Bulgarian friends said, it's popular there. I knew someone from Romania. He said it's popular there. So my guess is when you go into those other countries, they probably use other nuts or local ingredients. Like the basic mm. principle is the same, but you just swap out the nuts. But I think of pistachios. I tend to think like Sicily, Turkey, that area. So that's probably why that was common. Uh, yeah, we've we, this is something we think we've observed with food is like once you get to know food, uh, you can understand if. An ingredient is the key part. If like the dish is being built off of the ingredient versus if the dish is more like of that particular ingredient is more a, a process of preparing that ingredient. So if you understand something more of a process type of thing, then you can be okay, we're going to switch out this ingredient as long as this ingredient we switch in can still be, can still have the same process applied to it and result like that same original one. And that's something to kind of, kind of know. But there's some dishes where Sure, you can think of some way if you take out that main aspect of it and swap it with something else, the, the dish just isn't the same anymore. Yep. You know, I'm much right. else to say, uh, good dessert, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so next one here, we have the print candy bar, and uh, it's an espresso mousse with whiskey sabayon and, a can and candied hazelnuts. This was an excellent dessert. This is definitely something I highly recommend and would, you know, possibly get again. Um, chocolate, um... There's almost like a uh, – I'm trying to think what to compare it to. It's almost like there, there's like a hazelnut crunch or something inside. There's candied hazelnuts outside, caramel sauce, um, espresso mousse. I think that's self-explanatory. Egg, cream, all that with espresso beans probably. And then sabayon, the whiskey. So it's the whipped up uh, egg yolks. But this time instead of the cheese, it's the uh, it's whiskey. Um, so you get a little bit of that flavor too. Really creative. I, I thought it was impressive they went to make their own candy in-house because – I've made candy in the past. It's a little hard because you have to get like certain temperatures exactly right and like heating versus cooling down and all that. And then also just the artwork here that it has their name on it with the gold. I thought it was really nice. Uh. Yeah. And we've talked about this. We've been talking about this and in, in the, I think I might start putting in all the posts that we do this year, dish the, this little image that Steven sent me with like the mother sauces and things like this. And that's one thing we've talked about, just like stepping up your game up by doing sauces. Now we added, of course, talking about today. Now, if you are doing a sauce, instead of adding this corn flour, corn flour is still okay. It's still decent, but yeah, if you maybe add a chicken leg, <laughs> you put chicken legs, throw it in there. That's how you can thicken up the stock and things like that. Things like that. But just making different sauces, like, I did some baked potatoes, just did with uh, spring onions and, and butter instead of uh, sour cream and all this. So I was like, okay, how do you make homemade sour cream? So, okay, sour cream is rather straightforward to make. It's like whole cream and lemon. Pretty much what you do, you let it sit in the, and you let it sit in the whole cream, lemon, I think some milk or something like that. But you let it sit in the fridge for like, a, a, or somewhere cool for like a day, and that's sour cream. And I was like, okay, like, okay, sour cream, but then the whole cream, even the whole cream is rel relatively straightforward to make. It's like, uh, is it egg egg yolks or something like that? But you just mix it together with like anyway. With some of these things, once you understand how to make these things, it's pretty straightforward. And making your own stuff again, avoid some of these extra things that are added in certain things that you buy that might be oh this is cheaper in this kind of sense. But then you're getting that extra cost of having less flavor. You're losing some flavor, and you're also potentially adding some other ingredients that might be less than desirable. Um, but with doing things like candy, doing these kind of things, finding these kind of things homemade to kind of do things, like how much do, is this done at restaurants? Like when they're doing like a sour cream, when they're doing like a whole, like a whole cream, that, that stuff, do they just buy from people they trust or do, do they go to the extra step to try to make some of these things in-house? Like with this one, like why not just order the chocolate from somewhere else with print printed on it? I mean, I think, again, I think it's, you could probably save money if you know what you're doing. I think it's like they want to kind of like put their own mark on it. Um, I think like if you make it yourself, you can like control the ingredients a little better. So if you want to add different things in the future, maybe like you can make the same chocolate. Maybe in the future you could do like a mint version of it or something. Um, like we'll get into the petty four soon, but like with a pat de fruit, it's like you take the basic recipe but change the fruit so it's easy to swap out. Whereas if you bought them from somewhere else, you'd be relying on them to produce what you want. So things like that, that'd be my guess. 
And when it comes to things like the creams and things like okay, the hollandaise sauce, that's something they'll make in house. Like what what are what are what, when it comes to like sour cream and like <laughs> things like that, that one they'll they'll probably buy. They're probably not making stuff like yeah. that in house, are they? Yeah, I mean, I mean, even the nicer places I worked in, they bought creme fraiche, like which is similar to sour cream. They bought it from a purveyor. Like I don't remember. I don't think anyone made it from scratch. I mean. Okay. I don't know. Maybe there's some like really high end French places that do, but I don't think it's the norm. Uh. Uh, yeah, yeah. You probably, like, probably you think about it. It's like coming down to break it down the time wise, where you like yeah. you you paying this person like fifty dollars an hour to make <laughs> whole yeah. cream. It's like maybe it's not that 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 that's the use of the person's time. Yeah, it's like you're not going to spend time churning butter or whatever, which is easy. I mean, you can just over whip cream and you have butter, but it's like. You still have to buy the cream, and then it's like you tie up the mixing bowl. It's just—it's not practical use of time or resources. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You see, we're talking about those whole things, those like kind of farm community type of places where you can get the thing where it's like you, instead of having like a restaurant in the city and things like that, you have it spread out like that. Why you have kind of uh, the French Laundry where it's like in a little village. It's like in that village, maybe you have like the kids are the ones who are like churning the butter and things. So like it's it's. It's just this future kind of. I'm thinking of living in like massive homestead with like my friends and everybody's in different places. You're gonna give them kids, working together, grandkids, like family. You're coming in from you and not. <laughs> Could be an interesting type of environment with that. But yeah. Okay. So next we have uh, the black currant pate de fruit with a mini brownie. Yeah, pat pat de fruit. <laughs> so fruit. it's um. So I'd mentioned before that it's. It's actually fruit mixed with pectin, which is the gelatinous substance. It's usually found in uh, fruit naturally, like quince is a lot of it. Usually when you cook certain fruit down, it'll break down and thicken. That's The pectin is what's thickening it. But you can buy the pectin in powder form and add it to things to thicken it. So things that don't naturally have pectin, you can make them thicker. I, I sort of described it before as like somewhere in between jelly jam and gummy bear in terms of consistency. Like it holds its shape. You can chew on it, but it's not rubber either. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is a um, this is the um, what's it called um, at the end of the meal? How am I forgetting this name right now? Um, oh, uh, petty four, petty four at the end of the meal. Yeah, I don't know why I forgot for a sec. Uh, so it's a petty four at the end of the meal. This comes uh, automatically, whatever you get. Uh, usually two of them. This was one of the more recent ones I had. Um, this is so it's black currant pat de fruit. I like black currant a lot. I think it's an underrated yeah. item. Mini brownie, I think that's self-explanatory. There's a little bit of Maldon salt on top. Maldon salt is a popular um, English salt. It actually has, it naturally has a uh, pyramid shape to it. I don't know how that happens, something about the way it forms. If you look closely, you can see it looks kind of like a broken pyramid. So uh, what very popular. Saying? What's it? What? what looks like a broken pyramid? If you look at the flakes of Maldon salt, uh, maybe we can bring up a picture, but it actually looks like a pyramid, like it forms naturally. Um, okay. I mean, usually... Usually when you serve it, it's somewhat uh, broken up. Um, but I don't know. It's Maldon, it's just it became a very, uh, very popular brand. Like I remember when I was in school, everyone was always talking about the French salts. Like there was like Fleur de Sel and things, Sel Gris and things like that. Um, but I've noticed uh, a lot of places I work, they use Maldon salt. So I guess the texture, flavor of it just works well. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, it, with, with black currant, I think – it means it's a societal type of thing, maybe uh or just a culture thing. If something gets into our market, I think grapes have kind of taken the spot in the United States of America that um, black currant has in uh, in the at least here in Kenya or the, or in Europe. Because we had this like ribena is like a typical type of juice where they have it's like you find it in Europe, you find it here in Kenya. It's like it really comes to black currant um currant um juice based thing. Yeah, in I don't really find it. I don't really remember seeing too many people drinking black currant. Like, I don't really was hard to even find Ribena when I was in Kenya. I mean, in the United States of America. But maybe it's probably easier to find now that the world has become so globalized. But yeah, um, here, yeah, like, you don't even find grape juice that much here in Kenya. Hmm. Yeah, but you find Ribena yeah. everywhere. But yeah, uh, so that's just the second like thing. Yeah, it's a pity for. There's not too much to say about these. This is like a typical type of thing that they do. At it's of course a French type of thing, but it's something that now has been adopted by other I other just, people and things like that. I just sent you a picture of the Maldon salt up close. That variety there is smoked, so it's going to be brownish. Uh, typically, it's white, clear kind of. Uh, but this is a good picture of the shape of it. If you zoom in, you can actually see the pyramid shapes. Uh, yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah, it's just yeah. strange how different chemicals and things like that just create different little shapes that come up. Yeah, I guess that's on. the way it forms. The way it, the way it forms by the sea somehow, I guess, comes out looking like that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah. shall have that on the screens for y'all yep. to look at the Maldon. Yeah. Mal Maldon, the Maldon salt. No, it's okay. actually Maldon. No, it's Maldon because it's English. Because I remember Malden. I said that, and my chef corrected me because it's English, not French, so it'd be Maldon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No accents in there. No, there's. No, that's just the way they wrote it. That's just the font that they used. Yeah. Okay. Um, now the next one. We have a chocolate macaroon with salted caramel ganache and guava pate, pate de fruit. Pate de fruit. Yep. So macaron, for those who don't know, it's this uh, small cookie. You can do lots of different flavors. I love macarons personally. They are they get a little expensive, though, because they're labor intensive. My yeah. understanding is they're hard to get exactly right because you have to work the dough a certain way. You have to bake them. They can't be too thick or they get soggy. They can't be too thin or they fall apart. There has to be this very exact um, outcome. So chocolate, that's the chocolate in the uh, dough itself, salted caramel ganache. Ganache is chocolate and cream. It's usually worked. It's the basis for chocolate filling and other things. So, of course, salted caramel in there. I think that's self-explanatory. And Pat de Fuis, them is the last one, but this is guava instead of blackcurrant. Yep. Guava is another slept-on fruit. Yep. Very seedy. Like, when you actually bite into it, it can actually chip your teeth. <laughs> the seeds inside yeah. are, are not forgiving at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So, the guava is... Um, and ants seem to really like guava trees. Like yeah. they, they have some really smooth bark, but they seem to be like holes in the thing where like you almost get the situation where you have ants living inside the guava trees. You often see that here in, in Kenya when you find these guava trees. But yeah, um, and I was, another thing with the macarons, I just don't like how close the name is to macaroons, which are entirely different coconut delectable yeah. dishes. So it's like, just get the name a bit different. <laughs> like uh, somebody... Somebody change a name. I, I mean, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd be upset if I ordered one and got the other. <laughs> if I was thinking to have one, like, okay, I'll settle for this, but I'll, I'll, I'll still be happy. But yeah, it's well, they're just they're relatively different things for for what you'd they pay, are. You pay you'd pay a lot more for these because I've seen like yeah. these are sold for like twenty for like one box. The macarons you can get like a container for like five bucks or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Yeah. I actually prefer the macarons. It's, it's, I am, but I'm a big fan of coconut. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not much to say about those. Uh, it means pot, it's, it's, it's petit fours. We've talked about the pot de fruit already, so we'll just yep. jump to the next one. Yep. And this one is a strawberry vanilla macarons with a rhubarb pot, pot de fruit. Oh, interesting. So now you see they're using some of the things that we used before. Yeah. Because, yeah, strawberries have been there before. So this is something that we normally notice in restaurants that you'll see they'll normally try to use an ingredient in two or three dishes. That's a yeah. a good use of an ingredient that you're getting. So you, they, we've seen these being used in appetizers, being used in actual meal with uh, – uh, yeah, being used in actual meals and not coming into like the, the, yeah, the, the, the rhubarb pie from the, the first part was really an excellent use of rhubarb. And we've seen rhubarb being used a lot. Yeah, just tell us about this. How did it taste? Yeah, so I mean, I think you can tell it's like almost like strawberry jam inside the macarons. There's a little bit of vanilla. It's hard to see. It's very tough to see from here, but you can see little black specks in the macaron. That's actually vanilla bean in the macaron itself. Um, rhubarb is interesting because it's somewhat sour. You have to add a lot of sugar to it. So, but so it looks like they added a lot of sugar, and then there was some citric acid too. So it, it's like sweet and sour at the same time. I thought I thought it was really nice. I, I mean, I like rhubarb a lot. I grew up eating it, so nice to see it used in different ways. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's a rather, it's a rather a versatile vegetable. Well, it's not because the part you use the stem you use a stem, not. Not the root. It's a rather vegetable stem, rather versatile stem. Huh. Yeah, because to be a fruit, there's a whole technical thing where it has to have the outside and the seeds are inside, and somehow the seeds are distributed when the plant dies or something. There's some whole thing with that, but then someone was telling me there's a whole marketing thing where somehow fruit became associated with sweetness. So, like, tomatoes are technically fruit, pumpkins mm -hmm. are fruit, but they started calling them vegetables because people thought of them as savory. Uh, there's some whole thing with that. Uh. It's fake news. <laughs> it's yeah. fake veg. Okay, so the next one is uh, vanilla macaron with, uh, with macaron uh, with uh, chocolate passion fruit ganache and apricot pot de fruit. 
that the food. Yeah, this, this is probably would be my favorite one because I mean, it, and of course with the macarons, that's one of the things you can do that is better than tops and macarons is the, the wide range of colors and looks that you can get. It's a very Instagrammable type of thing, and uh, I think women in general <laughs> find the aesthetics of the macarons uh, very, very uh, appealing. Like men do too, but it's just it's. Yeah, I thought chocolate and passion fruit was a good combination because you have the 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 richness, but you also have kind of that acidity and like a little it's a little sour, like it works well together. I think chocolate and citrus is kind of underrated. Like I love chocolate with orange, DB Bistro, if you remember how to dessert like that. Um I just think chocolate and citrus works really well and it's see it's cool to see them experimenting with different stuff like that. Um not much else, much else to say besides that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, not much to add to either. The passion fruit is one of my favorite fruits. It's one of my favorite flowers as well. This amazing looking flower for that for that plant. And uh, the last one here is some guava pat, pat de fruit with a uh, nougat and dried strawberries and chocolate. Yeah. So nougat, for those who don't know, it's a candy made from egg whites, typically whipped up, similar to meringue, but it's dried out. Usually, there's nuts and fruit in it. This one, I think you can tell it's pieces of chocolate and dried strawberry. That was really good. I thought I had this one the most recent time. I thought it was interesting because macarons and brownie, the other time this was different. Uh, they actually make it in-house so, and wrap it themselves. I thought that was a nice touch. Guava pat de fui, same thing. Um, you know, I, I just thought it was impressive how the the petty four changed every time I went. Like they just it, it's cool that like even if you don't get dessert, I think you get this automatically. But like each one is different. So it's like you feel like you're experiencing something slightly different each time. Uh, yeah, and they could probably also use these in the restaurant. You know that whole thing of like putting in a chocolate or a mint on the on the pillow. Maybe that's something they also kind of get extra advertising where they some of these pot de fruit or something like that. Maybe it's something that's just put on the on the dressers in the rooms every day. So it's kind of like extra advertising for the actual restaurant for the people who are in the hotel. Yeah, and um, I've seen I've seen Petty for uh, they do Pat if we elsewhere like Les Bollier where I did my uh, externship like there was typically chocolates and I think there was a guava Pat if we typically um, I think DB Bistro may have as well it's just it's it's a useful thing to do because you figure it's not that far off from jam but it's a little more solid you can cut it into pieces so it's just like a nice little thing to have at the end yeah, yeah. okay and I think that's it we've come to yep. the end of print. Yep. And that's um, yeah, that's that's a wrap. I don't know what else to say. It's it's been a good restaurant, and like as Stephen said, this is something that he been walking by for some time and decided to uh, finally go check out. And we're glad that he did and took the time to come share that with us. And uh, it's something you know, some of y'all out there, if there's a place that you've been walking by for some time and you thought, okay, maybe I'll I'll walk in, let uh, decide to do that, and also let us know. Let us know if there's a place that you've recently tried that you had had walked by before and found was uh, pretty good. Right? Maybe if we sucked, just let us know. <laughs> Either way, well, we'll take any of the comments that, that you may share. Well, I was telling someone, I forget if it was Christine or who, there actually are good restaurants around here because the thing is, a lot of this stuff closer to Times Square is all like tourist traps. Like it's like overpriced food that's like, eh. But if you go closer to the water here, there's a lot of like little hidden gem type places. Like there's uh, Dolly Varden near me. There's this place. There's a uh, Ha Salon, the place with that steak I want to try. Like you just have to know where to look, but it's like, um, what was another one? Oh, I went to this place, uh, 44X. I don't know if you saw my post, the lobster dish and the banana split. Um, I went there once so far. We can maybe do that as a future one. Um, things like that. Like, you just have to know where to look, but they're a bit off the beaten path because it's like, this is like where tourists hang out. And, like, this is where people who live here hang out. So it's like people that actually appreciate more creative stuff versus this is like Olive Garden, Applebee's, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, some places can some places can afford to make a living or keep make a profit by just convenience, and that's there's going to be a lot of food for travel, a lot of like foreign foreigners and things like that. Some places, yeah, you're going to have to have a little extra thing to to keep your local regulars who are competing. You're competing with the local regulars who have may have many other places as well they can they can go to. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, um, yeah. There, there was that joke. What they used to say about don't party above like 14th Street or something, because the thing is, like, up here it's all like the touristy places, but downtown it's where people who actually live in the city hang out. Because it's yeah. like places that, like, you know, there's like speakeasies, there's like places that like have kind of like an underground reputation, all that. Whereas like Times Square, it's all tourists. I mean, if you're a tourist, obviously nothing wrong with that. But like, if you live here, <laughs> you're probably you're probably not gonna hang out over there. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. So, uh, is there anything at print that you haven't had yet that you're thinking like, okay, I really want my eye put my eye on this from the menu? Is there anything that you feel like you missed out on? You try to taste some different dishes. What's what's the next thing you think you'll you'll focus on when you when you go back the next time? What to print or in? Uh... Yeah, to print. I'm not sure. I mean, the menu changes a little bit. I mean, we're getting close to summer, so probably in the next month or so, they'll start doing different things. I may try the tile fish if I go back soon. Um, one of the guys there said it was his favorite entree. They've got some other interesting stuff, too, like a cheese charcuterie. I may get that. I'm not sure. I may go for breakfast eventually, but like I say, I don't get up that early typically. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I have like a rare day where I happen to get up early. Maybe I'll give it a shot. Um, you know, it's it looks like they're changing stuff seasonally occasional special like i love that stracciatella but the specials it, it's kind of you kind of play it by ear like some days they have specials some days they don't so um you know we'll just see i mean see see if i've tried most of the menu the menu is not that big but it does change seasonally and there are specials okay. so yeah. yeah and where are you going to eat today I'm not sure, actually. Um, I was actually eating a bunch of food earlier that Christine gave me. She made me some soup. There was some uh, chili and other stuff. I still have some rum, and I may finish that. Um, we're going to probably bring some food to my family, like I say, so I'm probably going to store that in here, so I'm trying to clear space. And, you mm -hmm. know, she goes to the trouble She goes to the trouble to make it. It's like, why spend money if I have food here? So uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had some in in – in uh in New York City, or Obambula, it's like Obambula. It's just it's tilapia, but it's like dried in a certain way. It's, I think it's just like air dried in general, but it really concentrates the flavor of it. Then you make a soup out of it, and then of course when you make the soup, the some of the it some the, some some um, moisture goes back into the actual dried fish itself. But then it's really concentrated taste. Had it with like some creamed uh, pumpkin leaves and like ugali, which is just like a whole wheel, whole, whole, it's a corn like meal. It's like, think polenta, but it's like harder. It's like porridge. It's just, it's just less water. So it gets more of like a cake type of thing. Yeah, that's, that's what, is what we had here. But yeah, it's, it, I hadn't had the bambula for some time. Tilapia is a common fish that we eat here in Kenya, but um, this kind of preparation of it was interesting. So I'm kind of I'm looking now to like trying to do my own things, something like dry my own fish, or like, have some chilies or like try like dry them. They say the best way to do it is like air dry, but you got to find at least like three days where you have like a lot of sun. But right now it's like the rainy season, it's rather cloudy. So might try like oven them or do like the hanging type thing. But anyway, yeah, that's I told, different I kind told of food Chris, experiences. I told Christine she's saving me money too because she's cooking a lot. Like I'm buying the food, but like yeah. last time I went to the store, I spent like 60 bucks, but it's like food for a few days. Whereas I go out on yeah. my own. <laughs> So it's like, and I've been cutting back drinking too. So between all of that, I'm actually saving money pretty well, which is good. And um, she's good motivation for me not to drink because she doesn't drink much herself and gets drunk off nothing. So it's like, um, you know, motivates me not to drink. And I think I've said this to you before, but it's one of those things where like you cut back, you realize like you don't miss it as much as you think. Like, I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm still doing some wine pairings, occasional craft cocktail, but like certainly not every day and not so many portions. It's just like, I shouldn't be doing, I shouldn't have been doing that. It's just, it's too much, too much money. It's not healthy. And it's like, uh, yeah. I just, I don't know. I, I should have outgrown all this by now, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, for me, for me, it was just like, yeah, the, the process, it would take a lot to get drunk, but even if you're not like getting wasted, just even just yeah. the small things where you go out and like there's like some blurriness in the memory and like where like did we meet at this point or did I go there first? Or you you had some idea come up to you or some cool conversation and you just miss like a little part of it. And even just like the slight hangover the day after it, the negatives were just piling up too much for me with, with no positive. So I was just like, Yeah, I'm I'm done with it. And, well, yeah, well, I've been done with it for what, six years now or something. Well, I think I've talked to you about this before, too, even if I wasn't hungover, it was just like messing with my sleep and like, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, waking up, feeling tired, being dehydrated, like my skin was dried out. I'm just like, I, this isn't like I shouldn't be doing this. You know? Yeah. All right. So don't drink out there, guys, gals and everybody else in between. But otherwise, you can <laughs> you can still check out <laughs> these conversations that we're having. Stephen hasn't quit drinking completely. So there's still like some wine pairings and things like that will go on. Yeah. We have different things. Even if you check out chefnadup.com33.com, there's different cocktails and stuff like that that I was making back then. Not just saying, not damning anybody who does it. It's just something I don't do anymore. Steven is reducing on it. But as we yeah. mentioned, we're going to be getting more people into this series. So when those other people come in, they might have more wine pairings with their dishes if Steven eventually ends uh, his, his drinking and putting that with the actual dishes. 
But uh, we also have our friend Laura. We had a different conversation with her. She's a wine expert, so maybe you can check out that stuff. We're thinking of getting more people involved, so maybe yeah. we'll just have yeah. Laura come on and just tell us more things that are happening in the wine industry and things like that and whatnot. But yeah, anything else sure. you want to say about print as we sign off here? Not really. I recommend it. I mean, good food prices, in my opinion, are reasonable. Uh, one of those places I felt like I get what I pay for. I don't feel like I'm being ripped off. Uh, like I say, the menu is small and it changes seasonally. So I like I wouldn't go there all the time. But at the same time, like, you know, you can go back a few times and maybe next season when they change the menu, go back. So on. Yeah. yeah. And what do you think we're going to be going next on this uh, dishing dish? We have as we're recording this, I'm still posting the the ones of Dolly Varden. Then after that, we have Babo, which is still two parts of that to post. And then there'll be the two parts of the print to post. So we normally record these ahead of time, looking into eventually possibly doing like live recordings of these. Maybe yep. we get like a local speed or something where it's like different people can watch live as we do it. Do we do it live and then eventually post later? But we have the schedule kind of do these. So what, what, what are the potential restaurants that you're thinking would be coming up? So I'm thinking about 44X. I really like that lobster dish and that banana split I thought was awesome. Uh, I was telling Christine she'd probably like that lobster dish a lot because she likes asparagus, lobster, stuff like that. They have a duck breast that looks nice. You know I love duck. Uh, they had lobster tacos that looked interesting. Um, scallop dish, like a lot of stuff that's kind of up my alley. Um, right. You know, more, not exactly like print, but kind of like, you know, the new American, a little more creative. Uh, so that that's a potential place. Uh, I'll see you with Abraham. Um, you know, maybe go to Hassel and see how that goes. But that's only open like three days a week or something, and it's busy. So we got to reserve in advance. Um, it just occurred to me too, maybe I could do um, Mocha Red, that uh, kosher place that I've gone to with him. I have some photos from there. We'll see. Um, I got I still got a post from weeks ago, but I had a turkey leg there that was cool. They actually mm -hmm. uh, flung, they flambéed it table side and they cured it to taste like ham. Um, I had a Leonese salad, but made with lamb bacon instead. Yeah, very creative. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't typically eat kosher, but like I'll go with him and like his, his brother joined us last time. And I was impressed. So, I mean, the stuff they do with what they eat. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we've got a lot on the docket coming up. And if y'all have enjoyed this series, we've also been very thankful for y'all to actually listen to these things. And there's a lot of other restaurants already if this is the first one you're listening to the series if it's the last one by the time you listen to this we have recorded more so there will be more to come uh, so you can just come along with us and we also have a lot of other stuff from other conversations talking about other topics if you are an, at, lot, <laughs> at least been entertained with some of the digressions that we go on we have other conversations today where it's just those digressions those are the main things and sometimes we digress into food in those ones <laughs> so it's kind of the inverse of what you experience here but otherwise, Stephen, thanks as usual for joining us in this. And uh, guys, gals, and everybody else in between, goodbye. Goodbye, thank you.